Last weekend, we discussed the lousy U.S. healthcare system from a more theoretical viewpoint in terms of its lack of market pricing. But this weekend, we'd like to talk to an actual practitioner who's in the trenches and on the front lines of providing medical care every day. Dr. Michael Akkad is a cardiologist in San Francisco who somehow finds the time to write and blog on medical issues from an Austrian and a libertarian perspective, including articles he writes for us here at Mises.org. And he's here to talk to us about what it's really like to practice in this brave new world of Obamacare. And if you think you're just a number when you go to visit your doctor, you're going to find out that that's actually true. Your doctor has a small iPad with him, and he finds a coding number that determines whether and if and how much that doctor is going to get paid for your visit or your particular symptoms. So Dr. Akkad is here to explain not only that, but what he and some other libertarian-minded doctors are doing to try to change the system from within. So stay tuned for a great interview with Dr. Michael Akkad. Doctor, tell us a little bit about your journey. How did you become, I guess, first and foremost, a libertarian and so well-versed in Austrian economics, which you've written about uh, both for Mises.org and on your own site? It's a work in progress. There's no question about it. But it's, when I um, finished my training, I was pretty much of a progressive mindset. And uh, I joined a large HMO here. And I worked there and, and sort of uh, did well and, and moved through the ranks, but then it gave me a, a glimpse into the whole aspect of central planning to really understand how these large organizations work. And so I was, I was uh, you know, dissatisfied with that. And then that was in, in 2007, I, I um, discovered Ron Paul, and that completely changed my outlook on everything. And then, you know, shortly, shortly uh, thereafter, I discovered the Mises Institute. And so it's been, you know, a complete shift in understanding of how things work. And then I decided to uh, uh, realign my career with what I, I thought was the right thing to do and the prudent thing to do also as a doctor, not being uh, at the mercy of, of these very large bureaucracies. But let me ask this hypothetical situation. You mentioned discovering Ron Paul in 2007. In the late 1960s, Ron gets out of the Air Force where, into which he was drafted during the, uh, the Korean conflict. Um, he's in South Texas He's done with medical school. He's an OBGYN. He partners up with an older retiring OBGYN. And on day one of Ron Paul's medical career, he has a waiting room full of patients. He has zero student loan debt. And each and every one of these patients is paying cash, mind you. If they can't pay cash, they work out a payment system, or many of the patients they simply do for free. And every employee, down to even his receptionist, is directly involved in patient care in some way, you know, taking their temperature, blood pressure, etc. There is not a single member of his paid staff whose, whose job is billing. Right, right. Contrast this situation to the average doctor's experience today. First of all, it's almost impossible for a doctor to have a solo practice and still work within the system of uh, insurance payment. The overhead cost is just prohibitive. So most doctors have abandoned their solo practices and have joined larger and larger, you know, increasingly large groups of doctors, medical groups. And for a while, there was a trend for doctors within a specialty like, you know, cardiology or OBGYN or whatever to sort of join together and share the overhead. But now even these groups are too small to overcome the uh, the regulatory burdens. So they frequently, you know, you have groups of doctors that sell their practices to join very large entities of multi-specialty groups, frequently associated with a hospital. And you have an army of administrators that oversee the work of doctors to make sure that it complies with regulations for the purposes of billing and coding and all that nonsense that doctors have to uh, to go through in order to get some reimbursement from the third parties, you know, primarily the government. Uh, but, you know, the insurance companies are no different. They essentially copy whatever rules Medicare enacts. I call it bureaucratic mimicry uh, because you have the, the huge bureaucracy of the government that imposes rules. And then uh, on the receiving end, you have to mimic that. So you, so you need to create very large bureaucratic entities to sort of uh, respond and speak the same language as the governmental bureaucracy. 
Well, doctor, you mentioned coding. When, it, when you're sitting in the examination room, it seems like today your doctor comes in and he or she has a sort of an iPad, a tablet, and, and they're trying to fit you into some sort of numerical coding, in other words, your symptoms or your treatment, to satisfy insurance billing so that they get paid. Am I understanding that correctly? So that's exactly right. It's, it's a, it completely distorts the thinking of doctors, uh, forces them to simplify or to make a caricature of what their clinical impression is in order to fit into the template of the coding system. And the coding system is the language that payers uh, understand. So clinical care now is, is not what you think uh, about what you think the patient has, but it, it's about what you think the insurer can understand. But it's more than just bureaucratic, right? It's more than just dollars. Isn't there an ethical component here? There's, the insurance company now stands as an intermediary between the doctor and the patient. And for me, from a, a patient uh, uh, privilege standpoint, what if someone had symptoms that, that were embarrassing to them? What if someone had a substance abuse problem? What if someone had a sexually transmitted disease? I certainly would think that most patients would now be very reluctant potentially to reveal this to their doctor because it's being recorded, it's going into a database, and their insurance company is going to know about it, and it might well affect them financially down the road. You're absolutely right. And uh, so, the, so the privacy is completely lost, even though you have a law that's called HIPAA, which, uh, you know, laws are always named, <laughs> the name of the law is exactly the opposite of what the law actually does. So instead of protecting privacy, which is the PP in HIPAA, it actually, you know, destroys privacy. But I, I would rephrase uh, what you said. You said that the, the insurance company is the intermediary between the doctor and the patient. Uh, that's not quite right. How I view it is that the physician has become a subcontractor to the insurance company because, um, uh, by and large, most physicians and hospitals, you know, over the last 30 years, sign either implicit or explicit contracts with third-party payers. With, with private payers, it's, it's an explicit contract. And with the government, it's an implicit contract. If you pra practice medicine and you don't actually opt out of the Medicare system, you're implicitly uh, in a contract with the government. And your role is to, quote unquote, provide care. And that provision of care is dictated by the third party. And it's the, the hand that feeds you as a, as a physician. And so, so in a way, there, there's, I think to me, it's, it's uh, ethically problematic for a doctor who on the one hand, promises to do what's right for the patient, and on the other hand, has signed a contract to fulfill the, the promises of the third-party payer. And so, so the doctor has two masters, if you will, and they will tend to respond to the demands of, of the payer because the payer exercises influence on their income. So that's, that's, that's problematic. Now, many doctors try to do the right thing and go to, to great uh, expense to do the right thing and, and fight the system and so forth. But it's a little bit accidental to, to their contract. You know, it, it's, they do this above and beyond what the contract calls for. You know, the contract that they sign with the insurance company just says provide care under our terms, you know, the terms of the, uh, of the third party payer. So that's their, their primary obligation. And as these demands uh, become more and more onerous and there's less and less privacy, um, then doctors, you know, have, uh, feel more and more corners into doing things uh, to the interest of the payer rather than to the interest of the patient. So if the insurance model distorts the doctor's incentives, surely it distorts the patient's incentives, right, too. I mean, if you have a patient sitting in front of you, do you have a sense that your patients, since they don't know what things cost, that they don't take as much responsibility for their own health and that they sort of just expect you to give them pills that make things better? There's no question about that. That's, that's you know, what's called moral hazard, which, you know, Austrian economists know very well. Uh, when they talk about uh, the, the, the Federal Reserve and the bailing out of, of banks and so forth. But the same principle happened in healthcare. So when the cost of your care is paid for by a third party, uh, it's very easy to lose sight of what's reasonable as a patient and to demand more. There's no end to what you could demand and think that is going to be to your benefit. And um, both doctors and, and patients are are confused and, and lose lose track of the value of things when it's paid for by a third party, you know, when there's a promise to, to pay for care. Uh, you can't gauge, you, you know, there's no price with which you can gauge the relative value of different services. And so, so it's a problem for, for both 
patients and doctors. And in my mind, it's the main factor that's uh, responsible for the escalation of costs over the last 50 years. For the average doctor, if a patient did come in, let's say to a cardiologist like yourself, and said, I want to pay cash, uh, the doctor doesn't even really have a coherent starting point, right? I mean, the, the doc- doctor doesn't have a price to offer. That's correct. It's, it's, uh, it's very hard to come up with a price because there, there's, no, there's no market price for things. So, you know, you can, you, there is ostensibly, there's a list price uh, that doctors, uh, that's completely fictitious. You know, it, it's the list price is uh, the price, the starting price that doctors and hospital uh, put out before they start negotiating with uh, the third party payers. And then there's a nego- the, the price that they negotiate with the third party payers, which is a fraction of the list price. And typically, when a patient who does not have insurance needs to get care and gets care, you know, in an, on an emergency basis in a hospital or, or with a doctor, then they get charged the list price, which is an absurd price that's that's you know extremely inflated. And 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 they sometimes they the the doctor or the hospital have to by law have to charge that list price because there's some regulatory reason why they could not give them a you know. A discount, or if they did, you know, the government may say, "Well, why did you give the, the that patient a discount, which is less than our contracted price?" That sort of thing. I mean, it, it gets to be very complicated. But you're right. I mean, there, there's no price. If somebody wants to open a cash practice, it's it's you have to construct your own price schedule, and you know. But at that point, it becomes more of an entrepreneurial decision of what do you think people or you know patients are are going to be willing to pay if they come and see you and and pay cash. And there is a, a burgeoning industry of doctors who have, you know, like me, who are just stepping outside the system and are offering our services directly to the patient. And, and you're, you're starting to see sort of a, a trend towards, if you will, an equilibrium of what, what these prices might look like. It's interesting that you bring that up because we see the market seeping through the cracks despite the government's, the state's best efforts. Um, a, a doctor doing exactly what you've described is Keith Smith. He runs the Oklahoma Surgery Center. And there, there's an amazing, an amazing landing page on that surgery center's website that's got prices listed, cash prices for a variety of things like knee replacements, hip replacements, you know, surgical procedures. And he's told me that this, the fact that this price list exists and that they get it oftentimes from for example, Canadian patients coming here and paying cash, that this not only bewilders, but it absolutely infuriates other doctors that this list of prices even exists. It's very important for us, uh, you know, to be transparent with our pricing. I mean, that's our strategy is that there are no hidden costs, that this is what you pay for, that, you know, we're, we're honest, you know, we work directly for the patient and for the best interest of the patient and so forth. And, and in a sense, uh, it makes uh, the other side look bad. It makes the other side look bad because they're they're enmeshed in this uh, game of out of control or, or hidden cost and outrageous pricing that uh, that takes place when you play the game of the insurance business and the third party payment business. This model, this insurance model, has been bad not only for patients, but it's been horrible for doctors too. I mean, hasn't the AMA completely failed? Even if you view the AMA as a cartel, hasn't it completely failed to protect the interests of doctors? Historically, there was a period of time where the doctors greatly benefited from the third party payments because when insurance uh, came about in the 50s and then in the 60s when Medicare you know, entered the scene, uh, they were paying under the rule of what's called the, the, uh, the usual and customary fee. So essentially, they were paying whatever doctors wanted to charge. And that's when you really started to see doctors get very, you know, quite wealthy as a professional segment. And that lasted for about, you know, 20, 30, 40 years up until you know the 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 late 1980s when managed care era uh, began and then doctors had to sign contracts you know formal contracts you know both with the government and with uh, with insurance companies and and price controls started to to get in and at that point the AMA collaborated with the government to institute these coding schemes you know to allow the uh, the the price controls and 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 whatnot so yes in a sense they have failed the doc- the you know protecting the interests of the doctor but you know that these these cartels these these uh like the AMA they they're primarily after their own interests first you know not so much after the interests of of those who they you know allegedly are trying to to serve there's an elite of um of people at the AMA that uh, you know look after their own interests and and they make their own money out of the coding and industry but speaking generally do you think doctors are less happy doctors in the US are less less happy today oh it's clear i mean it's there, there's plenty of evidence i mean it's study after study that uh, 
uh, rates, you know, physician uh, satisfaction. And it's been going down the drain for the last 30 years, and there's no sign of that changing. And you have many doctors who are trying to get out of that system, and and uh, uh, but in in a, in a way, they're they're kind of trapped. They've gotten used to getting paid by a third party, which uh, uh, you know provides some income security and. Uh, and and it's you know very hard for many of them to to uh, to try to get out of that system, uh, especially if you have uh, if you practice a specialty that relies a lot on on hospital care and procedures and whatnot. Um, it's difficult, but it can be done. And it's you know you mentioned the uh, uh, Keith uh, Smith's um, operation in Oklahoma, uh, which is great. I think it's a wonderful sign, and it's a healthy sign of of. Uh, People trying to do the right thing. Um, there, there has to be an entrepreneurial risk when you do that. Um, but you know, and many doctors are risk averse, and so they they prefer to stay in the system and and hope that things will change. But things generally change for the worse. Talk about Ron Paul in 1968. Not only did he not have debt from medical school, he didn't even have um, malpractice insurance as an OBGYN at that point. Now contrast this: a young person today thinking about going to medical school or getting out of medical school. Are kids going to do this if they only make one hundred and fifty or two hundred thousand dollars a year as as an employee of a managed care operation? No, they're not. And in fact, they're they're groomed right now. the 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 educational system grooms them to become employees and to not think too much uh, independently, to follow uh, you know practice guidelines, and uh, to just go in and and uh, adopt a a shift mentality where they large they, they work in a large group. And they see a patient, you know, when they're on and then when they're off, they turn off their pager and cell phone and turn, you know, turn over the care of the patient to somebody else and collect a salary at the end of the month. That's that's pretty much the model for the majority of incoming students. Do you think the best and brightest are steering away from medical school? Do you think that word has gotten down to young people? I think that's also has, it has been documented. Recently, there was an article showing that many of the students, as soon as they finish medical school, they actually go work for, you know, at least in the Bay Area, many of them go work for startups and and, uh, and try to do things, you know, outside of clinical care. We're almost out of time, but I wanted to talk to you real quickly about your blog. Anybody who's interested in medicine from a libertarian perspective, I recommend alertandoriented.com. So what's the goal of the blog? Who are you tr- hoping to reach? And what's the purpose of having the blog? The blog is uh, is to try to uh, educate my colleagues. Really, it's it's primarily directed at other uh, doctors and healthcare professionals who find themselves in this very difficult situation. You know, they're not responsible for designing the system, uh, you know, the way it is, but they're they're working within the system and and they realize that it's it, it has a lot of problems. But if they read the medical literature and the the trade journals and whatnot, they really don't get the right perspective on. Uh, on what the source of the problem uh, really is. And so I'm trying to educate colleagues about economics, healthcare economics from an Austrian school perspective and ethics from a libertarian perspective and so forth. Because I, th- I think when doctors get exposed to these ideas, I think they'll, they'll have the same experience as I did, which, you know, recognize their, their truth and then be able to navigate the system and, and perhaps find solutions, you know, on their own for their predicament and be able to, to improve things. You know, the, the way the trend is going, uh, this hopeful trend that I mentioned of doctors trying to provide solutions outside the system because the system has become so bogged down and, and so problematic for everyone that it's an opportunity for people to step outside of it and, and, and provide very good care for patients. So, so that's really the purpose of the blog. We're so grateful for libertarian doctors like yourself, like Dr. Keith Smith, like obviously Dr. Jane Orient, and uh, we appreciate what we what you do. We hope you keep it up, and we thank you for your time and, and a really fascinating interview on what it's like to be a doctor, a libertarian doctor from the inside. Ladies and gentlemen, have a great weekend.